Dr. Karan Singh, distinguished panelists and participants, ladies and gentlemen. The Institute uh, for Defense Studies and Analysis began its South Asia conference nine years ago, and quickly it became one of our flagship events. Over the years, as also this time, it has brought together an eminent group of South Asian academicians, scholars, practitioners, civil society actors, and policy makers and shapers. The abstracts and texts of the papers provided uh, to us reflect the remarkable quality of the presentations. In the past, this conference has straddled the areas of stability, security, terrorism, growth, and development. Last year's theme was the role of media in promoting regional understanding in South Asia. And following from this, culture as a factor in regional cooperation in South Asia was a logical choice for this year's event. We begin this year's conference by an inaugural address by Dr. Karan Singh, a many splendored Renaissance figure of contemporary India, scion of royalty, who uh, has waded into democratic politics, historian, writer, and philosopher. Dr. Singh was president of the Indian Council for Cultural Relations and is currently a member of the Rajya Sabha. He still holds the record in India of being the youngest ever cabinet minister. He will be happy to know that some of our panelists are also really young. Uh, Deputy Minister for Information and Culture of Afghanistan, Sayyid Musaddaq Khalili. If you could stand so that the audience can see you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Arif Dostiar, Mr. Sange Chopal, uh, Dr. Azra Nasreen, and uh, Dr. Yaqub Bangash. From the Hindu Kush in Afghanistan to the Irrawaddy in Myanmar, and up to the terminal point of the subcontinent in Sri Lanka, there runs a civilizational thread that links South Asia through Bamiyan, Takshila, Nalanda, to the Bay of Bengal and beyond. Quite deliberately, the forms of our, the focus of our conference is not on the common civilizational space of South Asia, but on the role of culture in regional cooperation. Civilization connotes a singularity. It carries with it a hint of hegemony. Culture exists at different levels, national, regional, and local. It expresses itself variously through cultural artifacts as much as the intangible, disembodied ways of life followed by a community or social group. Culture can divide as much as unite. The social context and political dynamics determine how cultural connectivity is used as an instrument of fraternal coexistence or a tool for fractious divisions. Our effort here will be to look at the existing ruptures, some caused by the compulsions of nation building in a subcontinent that has been fractured physically and psychologically. In the final session, our effort will be to seek out the healing factor of culture for uh, uh, overcoming the ruptures caused by history and politics. And uh, in explaining how uh, cultural connect across communities can play a positive role in building people to people bridges across national frontiers. In seeking positive uses of culture for regional cooperation, we could perhaps lean on the inheritance of Rabindranath Tagore, his values and vision of being at home in the world is best reflected in the poem from Gitanjali, which all of you know, where the mind is without fear. The school set up by Tagore in 1901 was called Shanti Niketan, the abode of peace. And 20 years later, Tagore started Vishwa Bharati, inspired by a Vedic mantra, Yatra Vishwam Bhavati Ek Niram, where the world rests in a single nest. Tagore is the only poet to have authored the national anthem of two nations, 
India and Bangladesh for positively using culture we might gain by following Tagore's tread his legacy and his dreams we have to learn from Tagore's profound aversion to dogma and his equally deep attachment to reasoning his quest for transcending the narrow confines of nationalism his wariness towards the ill effects of Western civilization manifested in imperialism and the carnage of the two world wars, and his elaboration of Asian universalism can be a beacon for us today. During his visit to China in 1924, he said, I quote, let all races celebrate their own personalities and yet come together not as a uniformity that is dead, but in a unity that is living. This is a message that should reverberate again from South Asia as much as from Asia as a whole at a time when its economies have been unshackled and an uncertain world is seeking new moral moorings. The lesson for us in South Asia is that having won our freedom and unfettered our peoples we should strive towards inventive forms of cooperative relationships across communities and nations for the greatest challenge for us today is of ensuring inclusive economic growth and social progress. I thank you and we'll move now to the next stage of our inaugural session.